So um, I just wanted to say thanks on behalf of SEEDS. So SEEDS is the Students for Education, Equity, and Direct Service. Um, and we are very grateful for the panelists to be here tonight just to talk to our students about their experiences. Um, I also want to pop into the link, um, our sign-in sheet. So I'm going to throw that in here. If you wouldn't mind um, taking a moment right now just to fill out this doc, um, it helps us to know who gets to come through our events. Um, and yeah, I think that's all I'll have to say. I'm really excited to hear from the panelists and grateful for those of you who could make it tonight. Um, so why don't I hand it over to um, the first panelist who wants to share their name and pronoun uh, your current job and maybe a little bit about yourself. I'll go first just to kick it off because that dead dead space kills me all the time. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm Carmen Garcia. I um, graduated just like John Carlo in 2011. Uh, I now work in film and television, and I'm sure we'll get into all that later, but when I was at Reed, I actually worked quite a bit with Seeds, so um, great to see the new counterpart, Madeline. <laughs> great to meet you. Um, and I was a Spanish major back in those days, um, and certainly I've used language quite a bit in my sort of documentarian stuff, um, but there's a, a bunch of other sort of things that I learned during my Reed experience that have absolutely informed the way I do my job now. Um, and I won't take up too much airtime getting into all of that now, but um, I'll kick it off to the next person. So my name is Sherry Tiao and I go by she, her. I was a Spanish major at Reed as well. So Carmen, <laughs> we, I don't know, maybe we took a few classes together, I don't know. <laughs> Um, I currently work at, uh, at Oracle and I do marketing for databases and data science. And I did not get an MBA. So I kind of went from my Spanish major <laughs> to, to, you know, working for a cor corporate, uh, sorry, corporate company. And so I thought if anyone was sort of interested in how to do that or, you know, wanted some more information, then this is something that I would be happy to share. It was kind of weird. <laughs> I'll go next. Um, my name is Tina Sohaley. I graduated in 2007. Um, I majored in philosophy. Um, I'm, uh, my pronouns are she, her. Um, I'm currently a lawyer at the U.S. Department of Education's Office for Civil Rights, um, and I, wh where we enforce civil rights laws that prohibit discrimination on the basis of sex, race, color, national origin, disability, and age. Um, and so, I, before that, I uh, had experience working at a large law firm, and I've also clerked for a judge. So if anyone's interested in the legal world, I'm happy to talk about all aspects of that, or at least the aspects I've experienced, but I'm currently really loving um, doing civil rights work. I can go next. Uh, I'm Giancarlo Bruni. I just got my doctorate in molecular biology and at Reed I was a biochemistry and molecular biology major. Uh, my pronouns are he, him. My current job is a postdoctoral researcher in the Krugelek lab at the University of California, Los Angeles, where everyone is trying to find Lady Gaga's dogs presently. Um, and I took a long and winding path to get where I am that mostly involves science, but uh, we can certainly get into that um, as the night progresses. Miles, I think you're our last one. Oh, sorry. So uh, Miles Grimley. I went to read from 2003 to 2005. I studied physics. Uh, currently, I'm a manager at a uh, small public transit agency in Portland, Oregon called TriMet. Um, I'm in charge of a group that deals with data and reporting. And so 
you're on the website and you're looking at all those, like how many people are writing? Yep, that's coming out of my group, so. And students, if you feel comfortable, we'd love to hear who you are and what brings you here tonight, what you hope to get out of this event, um, anything you wanna share. Hi, I'm Lily. Um, I'm a sophomore, my pronouns are she, they. Um, I work with a B on Collective Voices. I'm the other um, person that does this series. And um, I'm just really excited to hear from all the alumni. Um, I'm still right now, I'm in the process of like declaring my major. So this is really interesting to me. Hello, I am Nabiet. I am currently a neuroscience senior. Um, yeah, I, I, it looked like a really interesting event for me because I'll be graduating soon and I'm not sure what I will do afterwards. And so I figured it would be interesting to hear what people are doing after read. And so, yeah. I'll go. Hi, I'm Dylan. I use she, they. Um, I'm the marketing coordinator at Seeds. Um, I'm really excited to hear about people's experiences, um, especially as it pertains to um, balancing, you know, um, perhaps like a commitment to academia versus like identity and social justice work and things like that. Hey everyone, my name is Ngoc Hui and I use she, her pronouns. I am a junior uh, international policy study major. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm hoping to learn more about uh, the opportunities out there, you know, figure out who I wanna be when I grow up. And I'm really excited that you're all willing to share your experience. So thankful. Hi, I'm Narissa. I'm an undecided major um, sophomore, and I'm also really interested in hearing about your journeys after read because I'm sort of not sure what I want to do afterwards. All right. Thanks, students. And Narissa, I'm loving that clipped, um, beautiful uh, photo. Thank you. Yes. Um, okay, so uh, I'll get things kind of started. I'll ask the panelists a couple questions. And then, you know, we'd love to have the students really just take up all the, the vast majority of this time um, asking the questions that you uh, that are burning for you and kind of being in conversation about the things that resonate most. So let me just kick things off with a couple softballs. So um, let's see, what should we ask? Um, I, you know, I think a really interesting one actually is how did you start your job search? So what, what did that look like strategically for you? Was it very planned out? Was it um, serendipitous? What was that process like for you? And when did you start that process um, when you were at Reed? Was that in your senior year? Was it, was it earlier? Was it after you graduated? Kind of what was your trajectory with that? So I can start. <laughs> Um, I, I had no idea what I was doing. So I, I graduated, you know, I, I majored in Spanish. Um, <clears throat> I wasn't sure whether I wanted to do more school or whether I wanted to go get a job or, or what. And I also had no idea how to start this, um, the job searching process. Um, my, I come from a, I'm a first generation college student and basically there was no one giving me any advice. And I, I, it was, I also graduated in 09 um, during the recession. And I, I think I just felt kind of paralyzed. I only applied to three jobs. I didn't hear back from any of them. And I felt like I was a failure, <laughs> not knowing that you're supposed to apply to way more than that. Um, I ended up doing AmeriCorps for two years. And then after that, I worked um, through that program. I made some connections with people and I got a job as a copywriter. And I did that for another three years. And so those were kind of like the more kind of fun, creative jobs. But like I mentioned, my family is first generation. And at a certain point, you know, my sisters needed help with school and, you know, my dad didn't have any retirement fund. And so I made the decision to try. <laughs> I know this is not a very popular stand, um, kind of 
goal at Reed, but I decided that I needed to make more money. <laughs> and so, you know, I kind of looked at what my skills were. I kind of looked at which jobs would pay me um, a better salary. And then I sort of strategized because I thought, you know, I was a copywriter. Um, I, I could do marketing. The marketers are treated way better at my company. And so first I tried to like transition there, but that didn't work. So then I started doing like free work for them. <laughs> so I would offer to write ads and blog posts and just different things that they needed. And I filled my resume with that. And then I started applying to a lot of other jobs. And then eventually um, I fooled one company <laughs> and I ended up working there. And then from there, I switched jobs a few different times and I learned different skills. And each time I was able to get better and better pay. And then eventually I, um, you know, I, I landed a more corporate job and my life is very stable and things are great, <laughs> even though I don't think this is what I dreamed of doing while I was at Reed. I'll go next. Um, just to wait, as a refresher, Carrie, you, you said your path to finding <laughs> I need like a refresh on the question yeah like when you started your job search and what that looked like for you you know what point in sort of your read trajectory did you start thinking about that stuff and what did it look like for you I um like immediately did <laughs> Um, I'm very practical in my sort of like orientation towards the world. And I um, knew, you know, I didn't have, you know, didn't come from a family that I could sort of coast afterwards. I needed to support myself pretty immediately. Um, and so I was, I think like the first day of my senior year, I was at the, back then it was called the Career Center. I think it's now called the Center for Life Beyond Read. <laughs> but I was just like there every other day, just, you know, having sessions with, you know, the folks there who were very helpful, kind of, you know, exploring, you know, what I could do, kind of like Sherry, like I, I, like I had a Spanish major, but I also kind of knew that wasn't, I wasn't interested just, you know, to come out straight with it in going into academia. I was interested in sort of like working, you know, in a, in a, in a job that was more sort of, I guess, just, I don't know the, what the words were, but I knew I didn't want to keep being in school. I wanted to be out. Um, and so I was, I used the resources at Reed, honestly. I, I was at, I really recommend using the Center for Life Beyond Reed and kind of creating relationships with those folks soon. Um, I did that, you know, kind of like incessantly. And um, I'm glad I did because, you know, there's no guarantees. It's still a tough job market, but I was presented with sort of opportunities that I just wouldn't have come across by my own finding. Um, and so that ended up in me getting an inter a paid internship with The Nation magazine, which is, you know, the, the first abolitionist magazine in the United States. They have a sort of legendary internship program that connects interns um, very specifically with writers and with other people in the media world in New York City. Um, and so on a sort of non-professional bent, on a social bent, I wanted to move to New York too and live there. And so I really sort of targeted my job search towards where I wanted to be as well. Um, and then I got the internship and it's so funny because immediately the internship was for three months. And the second that I got to New York, I also started pounding the pavement, applying for every media job that I could find. <laughs> um, because at that point, you know, I work in a different form of media now, but I knew, you know, I didn't have the family resources to sort of um, not work. I also knew I wanted to continue to sort of learn, you know, what the possibilities were in that world that, you know, at Reed, you know, I wasn't really aware of. And, you know, we all know Reed's not like a trade school. You're not really focused on a specific career path. It's a lot sort of more focused on the classic liberal arts education. So I was really, really loving just kind of understanding who I was in the professional context and kind of getting more in tune with what I wanted. Um, and the good thing I can say, and I would recommend this internship to anyone who's recommend, who's interested in media, um, is, you know, once you're sort of, you know, get a foot in the door, as they say, you have all these other connections that just, you know, a week ago you didn't have. Um, and so that was sort of the genesis of what I ended up doing. Um, but but yeah, I really sort of hit the ground running with the Career Center. So I would recommend that for folks on this call. And it might seem like it doesn't bear any fruit in the beginning, but truly for me, that was the genesis of, of a lot of other opportunities down the line. 
Well, I'll go next. Um, I um, didn't, I went straight to law school and, and I knew kind of starting junior year that that's what I wanted to do. But um, going from there to a job wasn't as easy as I thought. Cause like Sherry, I graduated law school in 2010. So during the recession, knew I wanted to do civil rights law. That was always why I went to law school, but no one was hiring because no one had any funding during that time. If you were a nonprofit, um, you were just trying to get pro bono legal services from law firms usually. And so I ended up working at a law firm, which was not what I wanted <laughs> in life and um, did not make me very happy, but really did help me pay off my loans. I had over $100,000 in debt when I graduated from law school. And I was also very fortunate that I went to a law school that gave me really good financial aid. So um, I would always say if you're thinking about graduate school of any kind, but particularly um, I know for law school, like financial aid matters a lot. Um, and so, but I still had a lot of debt and, um, you know, I, I'm glad that I had the opportunity to work a job that helped me pay that down. But um, I would say like when I was then trying to transition, um, I did get in touch with the Career Services or Center for Life um, Beyond Read as well. I can relate to Carmen's um, you know, advice about like, just kind of keep checking in with them because I did, like I, I wanted to move back to the Northwest and as something I didn't know when I went to law school was, your geographic location of your law school a lot of times determines what kind of jobs you can get and where where people will want to hire you from. So even if you go to really good school, they might say, well, why do you want to move here? And so moving back to the Northwest was harder than I thought, but um, it was really helpful because they had a lot of connections in the Portland community and in the Northwest in general. And um, I really appreciated sort of having someone to check in with and that they would also think of me if something came up and send me an email. And so um, I, I cannot say enough how important it is to use the resources at Read. And um, because it's such a small community where people really care about you, they will try to put you in touch with people who could help, whether it's alumni or um, other people um, that they know and other opportunities. So um, I really appreciate that. But I would say um, it was kind of a long and winding road. Um, and um, I started working um, in May 2016. I started at the Department of Education and um, that was my first time getting to do civil rights law and it took six years. Um, and, you know, I did lots of other things that I, you know, learned from and gave me wonderful experiences and gave me the opportunity to economically support myself. And um, I really appreciated all of that. Um, but um, don't feel like it's not going to happen because you didn't do the thing you wanted to do immediately. And um, I think a lot of times people suggest like if you didn't want to, if you didn't do the thing you wanted from the start, then you're never going to get there. But I will say that um, that's not necessarily the case and that you're not going to always have the opportunity to do the thing you want because of things that are outside of your control but it doesn't mean that you won't like wind your path there and that like that winding path won't give you other skills and benefits and um you know financial stability that come really that make give you a better opportunity to enjoy your life doing the thing you want once you get there so I guess that's like a long way of saying, I thought I knew what I wanted to do, but I didn't get to do it until much later. And um, and just like feeling like, um, you know, hacking away the thing you want, just keep, keep going for it would be my advice. I can, uh, I can follow with a cautionary tale. <laughs> about why you should engage with the Center for Life Beyond Reed early, because I did not. Um, I graduated from Reed in 2011 uh, with Carmen and I spent the next three months in my one of my best friend from Reed's family's basement with my dog because I didn't have a job. Um, I thought that I would graduate and get a job as a research technician because coming out of Reed, my grades weren't great. And I knew that I wanted to pursue science in graduate school. And I knew that I could not do that 
with the GPA that Reed had granted me um, because at the time grades had not been my priority. Uh, and I didn't, didn't think that they mattered quite as much as they do in academia. Um, so I bit the bullet and took a job as a lifeguard at the Multnomah Athletic Club for the following six months as I continued searching for jobs in science um, to try to expand my experience there. And it wasn't until I finally connected with the Life Beyond Read network that I was able to, to actually get a job. So the person who ended up hiring me in Boston, his wife was a Read alum and she convinced him to post his research technician position on the Read alumni job board. And so he hired me over some Harvard kid because I was good at talking and he knew that he would have to talk to me <laughs> every day. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, he took a chance on me and that totally changed my life. Um, and I was able to pursue science and I'm still doing so. And uh, now that I am a, a doctor, now that I have my doctorate and I'm a postdoc, part of being in science and being in the homogenous environment that it is, Dylan, getting to something you brought up, uh, has allowed me to do more advocacy and trying to diversify science and, and doing a lot of outreach where other people from my background and those who are from even more disadvantaged backgrounds could get the opportunity to actually pursue science. Um, and so that's something that I've been pushing for um, since I actually like landed in science as a career. Um, but yeah, it, it was a long winding path before that. So I got lucky, even though I only went to read for two years. Um, Carrie has heard the story before, but I've already I've already worked my uh, my top notch job, the job that I wanted when I was at Reed. Um, so I moved to Portland from Atlanta, and I work at a public transit agency. And so when I was at Reed, um, before I left, I was like, I want to be a bus driver. Like Reed College, it doesn't matter. I want to go drive a bus for a year. And so. Years later, I left in uh, 2005. In 2013, I actually was a bus operator for TriMet for a year and drove um, uh, for the city. I drove um, night bus for six months. Um, so I'm the, uh, the infamous night bus operator. Yeah, that's right. I like night people. Night people are my people. I can't do day people. They have too much time. But I like night people because they always have somewhere to go. And that's me, right? Uh, so... Eventually what happened was, is uh, I did go to graduate school. Um, I have a, a master's in psychology and system science where I actually um, was going to study uh, sex and sexuality. And so uh, prior to coming to TriMet, I actually did a fair amount of research on identity development and uh, mainly within um, black gay males was my uh, subject area, but that was what I thought I was going to do. Uh, eventually after becoming a bus operator, uh, they had these positions that were basically operations analysts. And uh, I walked into the interview and did the interview. And at the end of the interview, my dad always gives me this question. And so this is the part that you want to write down. Everything else I said, ignore it. But this is the part you want to write down. So at the end of the interview, you always ask your questions. And so my dad says, you always ask this question. Is there anything that you've heard so far that would prevent you from offering me this job? And, you know, if they've actually told you, they will tell you, you know, this is the reason why, this is the reason not. The next question is critical. Then you ask for the job. And so I'm in this interview and I actually asked for the job. And uh, my old boss to this day still tells this story because he was like, this guy was cocky, but he's been great ever since he's been at Trident. And now I'm a manager there. And so the way using the center light of uh, life beyond read or any type of alumni network, it's a risk that you take. And there are some risks that you take that are calculated and others that you take because you don't really know what's gonna happen. Um, so what I would encourage students is take risks, right? Go work a job that you've never worked before because you never know where you might end up. Uh, go reach out to alumni that do things that are 
may be different than what you think because you might find that there's similarities between that work and the work that you actually want to do. Um, and just reach out to people because that's really been uh, the way that you actually get lucky and you might find yourself actually doing a job that you actually didn't think that you'd want to do. Not to say that being a manager is where I want to end, but by taking that risk and saying, well, you know, here's a low goal. I want to drive a bus. And thanks to, you know, people read about your reports online. So that's my story, a part of my story. I love it. Thank you all for sharing uh, those responses. I'll just open it up to the students. Do you have any questions you want to ask? Like any responses, any thoughts? Just want to give you a lot of space. I have a question. <clears throat> Sorry, was it scary um, for the people that uh, came out and didn't really have any direction on where they were going? Um, like, how did you, um, like, how did you find that support? So I, it was very scary and I think um, I mentioned that I felt like a failure and I did because this was, you know, I had no idea what I was doing and I think I just had a lot of anxiety and it. I kind of froze up about what I was supposed to do next. And so I think I beat myself up about it a lot and that made it harder for me to try to you know apply for more jobs and to be able to you know like put myself out there and be willing to get rejected again and again because you know if you're lucky that's not going to happen to you but for many people as you're starting out that is going to happen and it's just sort of like yeah, you just have to tell yourself to get over it um what i eventually started to do was i was just sort of like okay think of job hunting as tinder like you just swipe on a million things. You just apply to a million things and just forget about it. Just forget about it completely because you know what? You'll just focus on it when you finally get um, a response. And then I can decide whether, <laughs> whether I want this opportunity or not. So after I talked myself into this mindset, that is, that is when I first, that's when I got my first marketing job because then I just started sending applications everywhere. And also, I think it, it also coincided with the economy finally getting better. So there were more job opportunities opening up. So yeah, I don't, I don't know if any of you will have this issue too, but, but it was just really hard for me. And I think that's just, um, you just remember, like, it's not you, it's happening to a lot of people and think of it as Tinder and don't let it bother you. Don't let the rejection bother you. I uh, relate to that. Um, I applied for all sorts of jobs and I had to like figure out a way to like talk myself into being excited about some things I wasn't excited about because I just really needed a job. Um, when I was, you know, graduating law school and then, you know, after I clerked and um, I had all these ideas about what I should be able to do and um, that like there's things I would have no desire to do, but just um, approaching it how Sherry described, which is you send your resume out there and when they ask you to interview, you scroll the website and you say, well, I guess I could see myself getting excited about this. And I'm going to talk about this thing that I can see myself possibly being excited about. And as you start thinking about it, you do start to feel excited about it. Um, and um, I, I also kind of subscribe to the apply to everything and it'll help you kind of figure out what you like and what you don't like um, and who who is looking for your skills because um, if you get like a lot of response from a particular kind of job then that tells you that your skills you know like if there's a part of your resume that speaks to that then like that's something like you could really amp up or like they really are looking for someone like you and um i i don't think a job is like a lifetime commitment in a way that you know other things might be, you can always decide it's not right for you once you're there. And sometimes that's really the only way to know it's not right for you. Um, however great something looks on paper when you show up and it's either working or not working, that's how you know, and it can lead you to your next job. Um, so I guess like having, um, knowing people in my life who, you know, now like almost 15 years out of read are still switching careers and, um, you know, 
making very different life choices. It's not that it comes from a place of not knowing, it comes from a place of knowing things by doing and experiencing and then moving on to the next thing that takes a piece of what you liked and leaves behind what you didn't like from the last thing you did. So um, wholeheartedly think that you never have to know exactly what you wanna do and um, that even if you do, you might surprise yourself <laughs> um, and change your mind, but like just get yourself out there as much as possible and um, kind of like engage in organic process with that feedback that you're getting from the outside world. I just want to echo what the point that Tina and Sherry made about the volume thing. Like I still do that. Like even if I'm like, you know, booked for the next X amount of years, I still, you know, I have a motto that's always take the meeting. And if somebody reaches out and you know, you're either not interested or you think you're not interested, right. Or you're not available always take the meeting because, you know, there are just kind of seeds that can be planted there. No pun intended, Madeline. <laughs> um, there are seeds that can be planted there um, that down the line, you know, I just had actually a call today with a production company that I think I sent an email to six years ago about being available and interested in working on this TV show. And, um, and so I think it only bears fruit and it's, you know, once you kind of get comfortable with that process, it, the easier it becomes, I think. So I, um, I just want to echo the sort of um, the volume concept. And I also just want to take a point to sort of uh, echo Giancarlo's point about representation in these professional fields that Dylan, you had mentioned um, about sort of, I, I wrestled that early on, I think, um, with like, sort of this imperative I felt to sort of do that type of work. Um, and also this imperative as a creative, I felt to kind of work in those fields. And um, I can tell you a lot of the spaces that I still occupy are very white male dominated. Um, and it, sometimes I still deal with a bunch of bullshit, like people talking about my hair in a Zoom that's with the network and, and all that stuff. But, I do think that just the fact of us being there, being at the table, so to speak, is very powerful. And so um, I think this is a long way of saying that like you can be doing that work without actually thinking you're doing that work, literally speaking. So um, I think that's that's a great point Giancarlo raised and I just wanna echo that as well. Yeah, if, to add on to that, to, so when you're out job hunting, Think of yourself as a product, right? If you were a product, would you buy you? Because essentially when you go to a job interview, the job interview is basically saying, can we work with this person for eight hours without wanting to get up and walk out the room? That's all it is because you're qualified. You're already at the interview. And so when you're creating your product, think about, especially the different fields that you go into, recognize the tools that are available to present yourself. So if you like to use social media, then make sure that your social media profile represents who you are within the workplace because people are gonna look at that when they go to look for products, right? And I'm, again, I'm not trying to minimize people to say that you're some type of inanimate object, you don't have feelings and values, I'm not saying that whatsoever. I'm just simply saying, think about how you would actually present that persona, right? If you wanna get into a technical field or you wanna do programming, do you use GitHub? Do you use GitLab? Do you actually you know, respond to certain things? Which organizations do you get involved with? Um, those are the types of things that people look for. And when I say those things, I'm not saying to go out tomorrow and create a GitLab account and then just start throwing stuff up there because you think people are gonna like it because people will see through that. Have it be a real reflection of things that you're interested in because the more that you show that you can drill down deep on one topic, people will take interest to that and they'll find opportunities for you. Uh, as someone who hires people and reads resumes, I'm about to actually go through this process right now. Looking at the types of products that people present to me stands out more than whether or not you're qualified. And so if you submit something to me, there's spelling errors all over it, uh, the links don't work, those types of things, that will automatically uh, move you out of the pile for me. If the job requires a cover letter and resume and you don't provide a cover letter, even like a paragraph, you get kicked out. And it's those types of things I think people uh, neglect and therefore they get disqualified and don't understand why. 
but just just big thing like if you were at Safeway and you're looking at a bunch of cereal are you walking by that box are you like I want to know more about that box and that's you know kind of how a lot of it works Um, I feel like as read students, um, we sort of like exist in a bubble that's very different from the corporate world. So can you speak a little bit about how the culture shock hit you after graduation, like especially as a young person and how you sort of maneuver the corporate space? So I... Um, marketing is typically dominated by women, but not the kind of marketing that, that I do, which is more technical. And so I work with a lot of older men and my manager is absolutely wonderful. Um, and so he makes things a lot easier for me, but I do constantly run into small things like, you know, an older man wanting to meet with me and then asking me to set up a meeting for him. <laughs> or um you know other things like um oh just like you know just like not fulfilling their tasks just saying like here like you do this for me etc and so because I have the support of my manager I always push back every single time because I do not want it to be seen as acceptable for them to treat people like that and I also do have meetings sometimes with them to just sort of talk through the situation etc and you know it is it is it is tiring, right? Like I get kind of stressed out about it. Um, I, I don't really love pushing back, but you know, I, it has to happen, right? There's no way I'm just going to let, you know, be everyone's secretary. Um, so that, that does make things difficult. Um, I would say that that's probably the most difficult part for me. I'm pretty lucky. Um, and I, I, honest, I honestly think that being Asian has its advantages because people assume that I'm good at math and, you know, smart. And they think I'm rich, <laughs> which, which is, you know, not, not true. So, so I think what I'm saying is that I, I think I benefit from some of those perceptions of me, and I'm very much aware of that. Um, I also benefit negatively from certain, certain aspects, like they think, you know, because I'm female, and perhaps they think I'm more submissive or something like that. I'm more willing to do this stuff with them. Um, but I think the most important part is probably finding the right manager because the right manager will defend you and back you up. And I will usually tell my manager that, um, like sometimes I'll tell him that so-and-so is going on and then he'll, you know, he'll say like, he, he'll, he'll always support me on things. And I always tell him like, no, I can handle it. Just like need you to be aware of things, but I know that he always has my back. And I think that is very important as you're choosing your job because I have had bad managers and I've had really good ones. So I think just focus on that part, perhaps, is probably my, my advice. Um, I want to echo the manager piece. Um, when you have a manager that you can trust, you can literally bring any situation to them and say, what would you do here? Um, and I think that's where representation also helps is, have you been through this and how did you handle it? Um, so I would say, for me, one thing that really helped when I started at my uh, at the large law firm after I graduated law school, um, I was the only woman of color and I was one of two people of color. The other person got hired on the same day as me. So, and I was the only woman um, attorney. So um, I felt like I was kind of adrift um, and I was also just new to practicing law too. I looked really young for my age. Um, and um, the thing that helped was to find um, someone, because there wasn't someone who looked like me who could provide me with mentorship, um, to find someone I felt like I could confide in. Um, so the other attorney of color who got hired on the same day as me became that person for me. Um, and then later on, there were others who were hired who also kind of like were, were that confidant role. But um, I felt like he was, he was a more senior attorney. He had been practicing for, I think, 10 to 12 years at that point. Um, but I felt like I could talk about microaggressions with him, talk about, you know, how to respond to them. Um, I felt like he had a really good way of responding in a way that balanced the, this is not okay with the like, but, you know, like I'm still like, you know, but I'm, I'm not going to, 
be un, like, I'm not going to be perceived as like unpleasant or rabble rousing, which is such a hard line to walk, I feel like. Um, and I think, you know, as a man, he had some of those things come to him easier because of perceptions about like, you know, being one of the guys on some level. But I do think he showed me a lot about how I could handle some of those situations. And he also was a safe person to talk to. And so I would say find someone that you can confide in. It's great if that person's your manager, but if that's not an option, which I feel like it's not in a lot of places due to lack of representation, find someone who's a peer that you can confide in um, or someone who maybe has been there a little longer than you and knows more about the environment and just have that safe space to share and like take feedback in. So um, with my um, manager who retired recently, who was, you know, the best manager I could ever imagine. Um, I felt like sometimes she told me things I didn't want to hear in terms of what I should do or letting things go and stuff like that. Cause my instinct is always to be like, no, push back. And so she um, kind of helped me figure out like where to push and where not to push with different people. And I had to sort of like trust that she was telling me that from a really good place. So when you find someone that you can confide in, you find like a mentor, you find a manager, someone who you trust, also like just take take their advice with that trust and um, kind of like lean into some uncomfortable situations, knowing that like they're they're doing what's best, like they're trying to help you and they're they're doing what's going to help you succeed. Um, and so, I mean, I guess my advice is just like find someone for solidarity in those environments. Yeah, and one other thing I wanted to add to is that some some of the people I work with are frustrating, but there are also a lot of really great um, people as well. And so there are a good number of older men on my team who will advocate me for me for me and who will back me up when you know someone else says something in a meeting or who will go to my manager and say that I deserve a promotion. And so I, you know, in the corporate world, there are some snakes, but <laughs> there are also a lot of really great people and just make, and, but I think the team is really important. The manager is really important. So it, if, if you have a terrible experience, um, I would say switch, try to switch teams if you can and find a different place. It's not necessarily just, you know, everyone or the whole environment. It, so the big ones for me uh, is, so I recently had an experience where I did work. I did a, a large volume of work and this will happen. It happens to me more frequently than probably others. So I do this large volume of work. I present the work to a group of people who are my team members. The team members exclude me, make a presentation to executive leadership. They get all the credit and I got zero. I got a, an after the fact, thank you. And so, one of the things that I continue to struggle with, and it's a personal growth thing, is how, how do you deal with rejection, right? So you do all this work within the workplace and you want to get recognition, but there are times when you will be rejected. And there are different ways that you can do it depending on where you work. I mean, you can go to HR, you can go to your manager, things like that. My uh, manager happens to be very supportive of me. And so we're going to resolve this. However, what it does is, as I was explained to him, is that it basically, it puts me in a position where I don't want to contribute with other team members, right? Because obviously if I make contributions, I won't get uh, credit for them. And so when you're entering into the corporate world, that's something you have to be very aware of is how am I gonna react to this thing? How do I react to praise? How do I react to negativity? What happens if I don't get what I want? Which leads me into my second point, which is, learn how to say no and learn how to receive a no because you're going to be on the receiving end of some no's and if you can get over the rejection that comes with a no a lot of it becomes easier and you when you take a risk you know that the worst thing they could say is no and so if you believe it's a good idea then you know why not keep moving and if they don't want the idea then that's why they have consultants and small businesses right the other part is is know when to say no and if that's understanding where your worth and what your role is within the agency, right? And so if 
someone asked me to schedule a meeting. And I'm like, I don't schedule meetings. You have to learn how to say no diplomatically with people so you don't destroy that relationship, which I think Sherry was talking about, but also making sure that you let it known, be known that this is not acceptable behavior. And so th those are really big things. And I observe a lot of people who struggle with that. And it's a personal growth thing. It's how am I going to, how are you going to say no, right? Or how do you say no to somebody else and receive it? My calendar is up to date. I love that one. Oh yeah, it's up to date. You go ahead and schedule. <laughs> and the first thing I do when they turn around and schedule something is I move the meeting. Every single time I move the meeting, I'm always unavailable. And that's that. And what it does is it, if you're too, what I find in the corporate world is that if you're too available, people will find work at your desk. But if I'm busy, it's hard to assign work because you can't pin me down. <laughs> and so I'm always busy, but I re re I reschedule meetings all the time. And what happens is, is people stop scheduling these nonsensical meetings with me. I did a very brief stint in the corporate world between being a research technician and graduate school in a startup. And I want to echo a point that Miles made about knowing your worth. So I started the startup. Uh, coming off of a technician's salary, I was making around 30K in Boston, which is not a lot of money uh, to live in Boston with, <laughs> which uh, they don't tell you when you take a job to live in a place if you can actually afford uh, to survive there. But, um, you know, worked it out, made it through. And at the startup, they effectively doubled my salary to $60,000. Um, however, what I came to learn after the fact was that that raise in pay was not equal to what other people with my experience would have received um, in that role. And one, learning that was very demotivating for me. <laughs> and two, uh, it really highlighted the fact that I didn't know what I was getting into. And had I had, had I built up a network of, you know, people in that space, or even just asked more questions when I came on to that role, maybe I wouldn't have gotten taken advantage of. And so I think you can use your alumni network and then um, other, other networks that you build over your career to kind of learn your worth and the and what you should be paid in any given role um yeah so that's that's one takeaway that i learned the hard way also just to um add to giancarlo's uh comment about pay um every salary is negotiable even when they tell you it's not people say that all the time and um working for the government I was definitely under the impression that it's not, but I really glad my sister is the one who said they're counting on you not to negotiate. Um, and I was able to um, negotiate a higher salary. And I started with two other people who felt like they couldn't negotiate. And um, they ended up like just taking the salary that was offered. And so I just, say i say that to everyone there is literally no job where you cannot ask for more money because if they've gotten to the point where they're offering you the job that means you're the one that they want and so that's when the ball's in your court to say well this is if you want me this is what i deserve to do this job um and i think particularly for people of color um we don't see a lot of people in those jobs and people also kind of count on us not to ask for more money and just to be grateful um, that we were chosen. And um, I just, I think sometimes thinking about from the perspective of like, this is gonna help the next person like me who asks for more money, get it by doing it, like help helps me to push for that. And um, 
to date, it has not worked against me. Um, I'm sure that there are situations for people where it has, but um, I definitely know many situations where not asking has worked against people. And, and remember, you don't just have to ask for money. You can ask for additional leave. You can ask for uh, money to be set aside for education. Uh, you can ask for additional retirement benefits. And so if they won't give it to you as, as payroll dollars, you have an entire compensation package. So always, add, if, if you can't give me 10,000, can you give me a week of vacation? I mean, it's, it all spins the same at the end of the day. I'm wondering, especially post read, how people dealt with exhaustion um, that comes with such like a intense institution. I know a hard decision for me to think about right now is whether I'd go immediately to grad school. Um, I hear it's hard not to, um, but of course, as Giancarlo said, it's possible to like not immediately go to grad school. I'm just going to jump in and strongly advocate uh, that you try something between college and grad school. Um, because grad school is a slog. And uh, it's even more exhausting than Reed was, um, at least for me, at certain at times, um, because you're juggling more than just your own education, you know, you're at least at the bench, as a bench scientist, you're in the lab, you're teaching, you're um, writing grants, like it's, it's, a, it's a lot. And it's valuable and um, important, the work that we do as scientists and, and in that space, but it's, it was very useful for me to be a technician and learn science in a different realm outside of just uh, academic, in an academic lab space. Um, and it was also very valuable for me to get crap pay at the Mac <laughs> and see what, what other jobs were like and you know, experience shift work for the first time in my life. Um, and, and know that there are people who kind of live their lives in this very demanding way that's very different from, from these high skill jobs that we get to occupy um, with our education. And there's, I think there's real value in getting that real world experience because you're able to speak to people on a different level than you do sticking with academia. I did not take time off between, but I'm a huge advocate for doing so for a lot of the reasons that Giancarlo mentioned, but also um, in addition to that, just knowing how to exist in a full-time job is its own skill. And um, I think like, you know, I worked at Reed part-time and like I'd ha had other part-time jobs, but there's something about being someone's full-time employee and just like learning what it's like to work a 40 hour week or, or more sometimes. And like, what what that means for the rest of your life and um i mean i i also think like it might be your last chance to try something totally different and random at a time when like you can really explore and as long as you're supporting yourself like you know it's not a long-term commitment to a particular field and then when you go to grad school you've already invested so much that you can't really have that same freedom so um I, I'm a big proponent of taking time off before grad school, even though I am a really bad example of that personally. Yeah, I would also recommend that because, well, first of all, I found working much easier than going to read actually, especially because then I could just kind of forget everything um, at the end of the day and just go home and relax and it was really nice. But I also have multiple friends who have gone to grad school and then sort of related to what Tina said, they started to do the work like lawyers um people who got yeah masters in various fields and then they started to work and they realized that they hated that career and so i think it's a really good idea for you to kind of test it out in, in any way if it's different than what you're currently studying especially uh 
I'll, I'll pile on the uh, take time off. I, so between undergrad and graduate school, I worked on a ship and I learned very quickly. I didn't want to work on a ship. I did that for a year. Um, I enjoyed the ship work. I didn't like the, the, my crewmates basically, but it helped me understand that even within this environment, there's these different personalities that you have to know how to manage. The difficulty on a ship is that there's 28 of us and land is away. And so you pick and choose your battles because you sleep in the same place that you do your work. And going into a corporate world, that became very handy because you didn't, I don't start fights that I can't finish that day because on a ship, you know, you get up the next morning, you're at breakfast and, you know, people are at each other's throats because you did something minor the night before. Um, but going to grad school, I didn't have that experience. Uh, but having, the point is, is that by, you know, go out there and explore something. You never know what you might fall into. Would y'all say for Dylan that it also, Dylan might make you a more competitive candidate actually for your grad school applications? I wonder if anyone's had that experience or known anyone. Um, it might make you a more interesting candidate just to have a couple of years of doing something different. So I know there are some law schools, Northwestern is the one that comes to mind where they basically do not accept anyone who hasn't had a couple of years work experience. Um, I think 98% of their uh, class has at least two years work experience. Um, I think, you know, having known people who've gone to law school and then after a semester or a year, after paying a lot of money, decided it wasn't for them or after graduating decided it wasn't for them. Um, I think there's a reason for, for that. And I would say that when you apply for a job after grad school, when someone looks back and sees that you held down a job for a couple of years before going to grad school and you didn't go just straight through, um, I think that bodes really well because they know that you are able to maintain a certain standard of professionalism and reliability. Um, so I would say a lot of grad schools look at it well and then your job after grad school would also probably look at it as a good sign. Uh, I'll also add, so I don't know about, the, it definitely added value to my graduate school application. As I said, I would not have gotten into grad school without that experience. Um, the other observation that I made about time between uh, graduate school and undergrad. So in my graduate program, uh, at least in my year, there were nine of us who started and of the nine, four of us worked prior to graduate school in some science or non-science role. And the others all came directly from undergrad. Every single one of us who worked before graduate school graduated before all the ones who came straight from undergrad. That's an end of one. So there are, it's a, you know, don't jump to conclusions about that, but in, at least in that lived experience for me, we came in with some experience that allowed us to power through grad school at a faster rate. Um, so that was that was that was my one observation from my graduate school time. Um, so there was definitely value of learned experience that I didn't even know I had that got me through faster. And you want to get through faster. I was wondering how do you all balance work and life? Because I feel like even my lead professor, you know, has a really bad example of how to balance. Uh, there's there's a work no life kind of thing, and especially since we are going through a very stressful time right now. Any tips, advice? I'll just say. So that I would. 
Go on, go on. Sorry, go on. <laughs> okay, so um, I think what you, so from my experience, what you will have to learn to start doing is learning how to say no. So here's, here's the thing. On a team, the manager typically does not dole out the work equally. The manager doles out the work to the person that he or she thinks will do the best job and who does not complain. This means that <laughs> if you have a tendency to take everything that's being given to you, you will get more and more and more and you will be overwhelmed. And then you will look to the side and you'll say, hey, like, how, how come all these other people have, you know, two projects each and I have seven? And <laughs> so I have had to learn to say, to, to tell people, like, I can do this and this, but not this. And then let the manager make the decision. So it's sort of like, I'm not saying no, right? I'm not saying that I can't do this, but I'm saying, well, if you want me to do this, then I can't do this. So like, what is it that you, you know, what, what are the priorities? Which do you want me to do? And to push things off. Um, I don't know how professional this is. And I don't know whether this is a good idea, but I have sometimes suggested like, oh, why doesn't so-and-so take this to my manager? Just because I feel like, you know, I'm just getting way too much. So I think learning, learning ways to diplomatically say no and learning to give suggestions on, on things is, is perhaps a good skill to, to learn and when to practice doing. Yeah, I think I totally agree. <laughs> I think um, learning how to say no is very important. It was a very hard lesson for me to learn, um, but it's crucial. Um, and just like sort of a broader point that that brings up is that you really all, like you need to be your own advocate. Like even if you have a fantastic manager or, you know, if you don't, like it's really important to, to feel that you have your back at the end of the day. And, um, and sometimes it's scary to do that and to like sort of, um, especially when you're more junior in a workplace to sort of draw boundaries and to say no, but it's incredibly important. Um, and, and what I was going to say um, earlier before Sherry made her point was that I also think it is a lifelong thing that I'm still always learning this. Like, you know, I struggle with it still myself, but I think um, it's something that I'm invested in continuing to sort of, you know, hone and I'm committed to that. But I think, um, you know, it's, it's important to just understand that it's, it, it's a lifelong thing to really sort of strike that balance. And, and also like in different parts of our life, we have different bandwidths for how much we can take on and how much we're not able to take on. So I think it's important to stay in tune with that and honor that. Um, and that's why I think it's very important to have a life outside of work and to not have that be your end all be all. That's also something I've had to, you know, really sort of develop on my own. And I really encourage you to do that too. Um, one other thing I wanted to, to reiterate, or sorry, to just mention is that not only, I have seen people work really, really hard and then expect to be rewarded for that. But that is also not often not what managers do. They reward the people who complain the most, the people who seem like they're about to quit. So if you are, if you're, you know, I, you know, people have a perception of me sometimes I think because I'm Asian and they think that I'll just like sit there quietly and work really, really hard and never complain about things. And I have to make sure that I am not giving off that impression. So I need to, you know, tell my manager, I deserve a raise because of this and this and this. Um, I have to tell my manager, like show my manager the results of the things I'm doing and, you know, just make sure that I'm tracking my results so that he is always aware of not only what I am doing, but also what my expectations are so that I am rewarded for my work. And I think it took me a while to realize that it is the complainers who tend to get more and not so, not always the people who work the hardest because I just thought, I was like, oh, the world is a fair place. <laughs> not always, especially with, um, you know, some of the past elections. But <laughs> I would also um, add on to what's already been said um, about maintaining boundaries at work and um, say that like, it's also important to have things in your life that feel restorative and to like kind of like have those be blocked out in your schedule. Um, so I like to give the example, like I 
Um, I love the ballet. Um, I love doing it as a form of physical activity. I also, um, it's like um, one of the things I do is I'm on the board of uh, the Young Patrons Board of the Pacific Northwest Ballet. And um, those meetings and like the, the nights that I watch the ballet or the nights that I go dance for fun are blocked out in my schedule. I mean, they're after when I normally end work and, you know, sometimes things happen, but on the whole, I try to maintain something that matters deeply to me as a sort of like rarely negotiable interest maybe, um, and have that blocked out in my calendar so that, you know, I can kind of know for myself that this is something that's going to happen. It's not something that I'm going to be like, well, I guess I could do this or I could just stay late at work tonight. Because the thing is, is <laughs> I think the tendency for people, particularly who go through read is like, well, I could always do more, you know, like I could always stay a little later tonight. Like, it's fine. Like I'll do this thing tomorrow. But, you know, having stuff that is um, you know, you're required to show up at a particular time um, and do it with maybe with a with a person or with a group of people are really great for ensuring that you have appropriate restorative time um, and that that is respected, um, not just by others, but by yourself as well. Um, because I, I think that's actually the hardest thing is to like, to not say to yourself, well, I can skip this. Um, I don't really need to do this. I can stay late. Um, and the thing I found kind of like what Sherry's described is like when you are the person who always stays late to get it done, people start expecting you to do that. Um, and so you also don't want to indicate to other people that the other parts of your life aren't important or you're like not, you're not going to leave work on time or you are going to sacrifice them because then they'll start expecting that and it won't be a thing where they look at you as exceptional. It'll be a thing where they sort of just have that as like a baseline for you. I, so I used to work for the Corps of Engineers right before I uh, worked on a ship and I had a, a manager. She told me one day, cause I was getting a lot of work. I was basically like an intern for the government. And so I said, why am I getting all this work? And she goes, the reward for hard work is more work. And that saying has stuck with me my entire life. Because if I work 30 hours in a week or 40 hours in a week, it doesn't matter. If I do a good job, I'm going to get more work. And so what I encourage people to do is, you know, have boundaries. You have leave and sick time for a reason. Use it right? If you don't feel like coming in, you're not going to bring your best, don't feel obligated to come to work, right? That's why we have those banks. And I encourage my employees to do the same. Um, I do also try to be mindful that uh, those that are my high performers, yeah, they do get a lot more work. Um, and so it's a, a struggle because, and it's easy. I know that they can get it done. The challenge is, is that what I'm working on right now is how do we actually bring the competency of the other staff members up so that I can now distribute the work evenly? Because in my opinion, if everybody within my group has the same title, it doesn't matter the request, they all should be able to do it to some degree, right? Now, my rock star is gonna put it on the moon, but maybe my, rocks, my other non-rock star can at least get it in orbit. And you know what? Most of the time that's close enough in the first place. So how do I get people just to get to that point? to be able to make the commitment and take the risk to actually deliver the task through. And we can work on the other stuff to get you to the moon. I mean, that's just time within a, a position. Uh, but boundaries are, I leave work, I start work at the same time every day, I leave work at the same time every day. And now that I work from home, I turn my phone off. And if you really, really, really need to find me, you better send me an email because that's the only thing that I'm gonna check. But that doesn't mean I'm gonna respond. Um, another quick tip, uh, especially if you if you end up uh, do work weird hours, because there are times I'm more of a like a I work on a ship. I work midnight to noon. And so 2 a.m. to like 8 a.m. is actually my most productive time. But I don't start working until 830. If you are a person that works non-standard hours in most email applications, there's a delay send feature. If you send emails at 11 o'clock at night, people will assume you're working at 11 o'clock at night. And so they'll respond. 
use the delay send and have it sent first thing in the morning. And that removes that expectation that you are available at all hours. Uh, but, you know, other than that, just have boundaries and communicate, you know, what exactly you're going to do. This is so helpful. Thank you so much. I'm making some notes. Um, one question, uh, and this was one that Avi had, um, is so if your major at Reed doesn't directly relate to what you're doing in your professional life, um, how did that work in terms of uh, job applications and explaining you had worked, you know, as a, you were a Spanish major and now you're applying for something else um, that doesn't require a Spanish degree, right? So um, how did you negotiate those sort of things? And was that ever um, hard to kind of explain or did it make you a more interesting candidate or something? I'll go first for the Spanish thing. Um, but also, you know, maybe this is a sort of uh, like ivory tower type of privilege, but I just feel like the places that I, it wasn't really ever an issue I ran into just because um, places that I was interfacing with kind of understood a liberal arts degree as a sort of um, not specialization necessarily, but a sort of broader approach to texts and to history and to things like that. So I don't have a great answer here because I never, I never honestly ran, ran into that at all. Um, but not to say that it, that other people don't, but for me, it was never an issue. So as the other Spanish major, <laughs> I'll say that um, I think the I think it's really the first job that matters. And so if you're able to land that first job, and I did AmeriCorps and I got some experience that way, then I think from that point on, it mostly does not matter. Um, I think the fact that I got a Spanish degree and that I did AmeriCorps, I think they do make me perhaps slightly more interesting. I'm not sure whether it's actually considered valuable though. Uh, I have been asked about the Spanish major occasionally, and my response is, <laughs> so I'm a marketer, right? So then I try to like, I try to spin everything. And my response is, oh, I was originally an English major, but then I decided that this was my chance to basically do the same thing only in another language, so I could challenge myself further and <laughs> talk about <laughs> So, you know, think about how you're going to spin it, right? And how, instead of just saying like, I don't know, I thought it was fun, um, <laughs> which is probably the more accurate answer. <laughs> um, you know, just, just think about how you're going to market yourself as you're applying for these jobs. I would um, agree with the marketing aspect of it. And I was philosophy major, which does not really translate to any job at all. <laughs> um, but, um, I will say that when I've been asked, I um, go with uh, something that I think anyone who goes to read can say, which is that, you know, I learned how to think and I learned how to write. And um, I will say personally, for me as a lawyer, I um, coming from read and having the writing skills that you get just going to read, but in particular from a philosophy background of really concise writing, um, it helped me so much <laughs> in law school. I, I cannot tell you how much easier legal writing was for me than a lot of people I know who came from very fancy Ivy League schools um, and, you know, didn't have that background. Um, so I, I would say definitely market yourself, but also just like think, think about it from the perspective of your read education taught you how to think about things and whether the subject that you chose to focus on, you're thinking on is a particular thing. The skill of how to think about things is a general tool that you're gonna bring with you to any sort of job you go to. Um, and I've also just found that to be true in my work is just my ability to pick up things like that I don't know. So subject areas, I don't know. I didn't know anything about physical accessibility when I took this job. and. It's very technical about, you know, how big a doorway should be and, um, you know, how many parking spots and what what do they have to look like and things like that. But because of my read education, I was able to pick up something new and foreign like that and sort of 
internalize it much easier than I would have otherwise. So definitely talk about the diversity of your read curriculum. So it doesn't just mean your major, because I think in a lot of schools, maybe that's true, but you had to take a lot of classes outside of your major in all sorts of topics. Um, there was no, you know, equivalent of like rocks for jocks. If you were a humanities person, you took science with science majors. And if you were a science person, you took, you know, Hume core with everyone else. And that is so important when you're trying to market your degree and don't let someone's opinion about your major um, define your educational experience because we all know and other people might not, but you can tell them that um, what we've learned is so much more valuable than, than what someone's perception of a particular major is. So in, uh, as someone that hires people, I don't actually pay attention too much to that. Um, uh, we've actually moved to our skills tests. And so during, as part of the interview, you have to complete an assignment and it's an analytical assignment that includes writing and presentation. Um, and that's basically how I test for people, uh, that are good candidates. Um, in the past, I studied physics, and so there's not necessarily a direct correlation into public transit, unless you start to get into the engineering technical side. So a lot of the times, you know, my skills aren't that worthwhile. Um, but the big thing is, is that you know your reading and writing skills and your Hume 110 is like the fundamental uh, is your foundation rather for understanding very complicated topics that you have very little interest in, but you have like two days to understand them before you go present it to a large group of people. And so, you know, that's like Tina said, that's a, a massive skill. Uh, Cause even the reading, I deal with the uh, American with Disabilities Act law type stuff. And it's like, oh, 200 pages and the meeting's at three and you called me at noon. All right, challenge accepted. So. I do, I do think I once got a job in part because I went to read and because the CEO was a huge Steve Jobs fanboy. And so because I work in the tech world, right? And so then he was asking me all these questions about what it was like. And I was really confused um, why he was so interested. And it wasn't until later that I found out he was such a huge fan. Um, and I, you know, I do get people who typically when they know read, they, they start saying, oh, that's such a good school. That's where Steve Jobs went, right? So <laughs> it does come into play there. How have you honed your ability to build a network? So was that something you graduated knowing how to do? Did you start out with a network of people and kind of build it over time? Um, how did you develop that skill set? And do you have any advice for our students about that? I'll go. Um, this is like very, un, um, it's not like data driven advice, <laughs> but I mean, just, you might, you know, I, I mentioned, you know, or a bit earlier, the always take a meeting, always take a meeting if you're offered a meeting. Um, clearly, obviously, to be in that position, you already have to have made some sort of inroads and connections. Um, you know, I don't have like as quite of a sort of a cute mantra for that on the front end when you're still building that network. But I do think the sort of, you know, for lack of a better term, staying hungry and aggressive with regards to outreach. Like sometimes people cannot, people can't read your mind. They can't assume that you want a job if you don't really express your needs and your wants out there. And I think it's very scary to do at first. Again, kind of to echo my own point about the lifelong learning thing, like it still can be scary when I'm reaching out to, you know, someone at HBO 
that I really admire this doc they just made and I would really like to work with them. It's kind of a shot in the dark, but I do think, you know, a lot of my relationships in my network now are just because I sent a cold email with something nice about somebody's work that I've seen. Um, and so I think that it's, that's what I mean by this is data driven, but it's certainly, you know, shown me a lot of different pathways that I wouldn't have anticipated. So I think just be bold and, you know, I forgot who said that. What was it? The worst they can say is no. The worst they can say is no. I think that sort of building that resilience is a huge part of success and longevity, being okay with being told no, and also just not to get corny, but you know, you miss a hundred percent of the shots you don't take. Um, I really, really live by that. Um, and so I think it's important to take as many shots as you can, even if it's just a cold email, something like that seems like, you know, like I remember, you know, and even today I'll like send an email to someone that I think is maybe a reach and I'll just be like, ah, like my computer's on fire and run away. <laughs> um, but then, you know, sometimes I get a response back and, you know, so I think it's important to just be really, um, aggressive is the wrong word, but to have faith in sort of your own potential for outreach as well. You don't always have to wait for the call to take the meeting. You can also initiate that stuff too. And something that's just kind of, um, you know, to be candid, people, flattery works. If you email someone and you say, I, I really admire this project, this sort of study, this initiative you're starting, I feel like I could, I could learn a lot from you. People really, really respond to that in a way that that is earnest um, and that I think is really generative down the line. So um, don't don't be shy with regards to that stuff for sure. Networking is a contact sport, meaning that you have to go make contact with people, and the contact is, it's it could be big or small, right? Like Sherry said, I always take the meeting. Now, I don't always move the meeting on people, but I do always take the meeting. And the big thing, especially new employees at, uh, at TriMet, what I encourage them to do is TriMet employees, and I would say people in general, they love talking about what they do. And if you don't believe me, why are we on this call, right? And so if you, you know, just that one basic fact, you can use a little bit of flattery and just ask people, hey, what do you do? Why is it interesting? And how did you get there? And most people will give you 10 to 15 minutes to explain how they got there. And maybe that's all that you actually need. But the big thing is, is that you have to go make contact with people. Um, you have to be able to make small talk. And especially in a virtual age, I, I am a small talker, but I hate small talk. But it's a skill that you just have to hone because you never know when you're in an, in an elevator and you make small talk with somebody and next thing you know, that person is a hiring manager. And had you not said anything, you actually wouldn't have made that contact. Um, so I, I encourage people just, you know, the only dumb question is the one that you don't ask. And no one will really know it's dumb except for you, but ask the question. You never know what people might actually respond with. Yeah, I think another aspect to consider as well, and I don't know how important this will continue to be, especially after this COVID era, but I, in the past, I have found vocation to be very important. So both for myself and for other people, just moving to where the jobs are, like even if you don't have anything lined up, it's definitely a gamble, but I just, you know, Seattle's a pretty big tech, tech city, but um, San Francisco is even more. And just the number of job responses that I got in applying to to jobs, because, okay, so I was trying to decide whether I wanted to move to San Francisco. And so I did a test where I applied to a bunch of jobs in Seattle. I applied to jobs in San Francisco. And I made, I didn't tell the people in San Francisco that I was still in Seattle. And I made some salary demands to see how much money I could get and how much response I could get as well. And I, you know, San Francisco definitely won, um, just both in terms of like, I think I, I doubled my salary by moving to San Francisco. Um, I got so many more job opportunities, like there were so many more listings. So if you find, and so what I did was I moved to San Francisco and then I looked for a job from San Francisco um, because 
I, I probably could have applied while I was in Seattle and seen if they would um, be willing to relocate me, but I also just wanted to change. So that's also something that you can consider if you're just not seeing the results that you like. Maybe you can do a test like that and see if it is just worth moving someplace without a job lined up and whether you're whether you're confident. So I, I landed a job a month after I moved to San Francisco. And then like from there, there were, um, you know, bigger tech companies started to try recruiting me off LinkedIn. And so it really worked out for me. And that might be something that you would like to try as well. I have a, um, so I, I would say like on the networking side, if I, I'm a huge introvert, <laughs> um, it's really hard for me. And I will say one thing that has helped is to do it virtually um, because um, there feels it's like exactly how Carmen described it is you literally can just run away from your computer and not look at it. Um, and no one's going to make you look at it once you've sent that email. Um, another option is um, to find affinity groups. So I know for the bar in each state, like they have um, affinity groups for, um, you know, different like attorneys of color, um, AAPI, um, all of them all of them have some sort of group where you can meet other people in your city doing all sorts of different kinds of work, but um, where you can have like that mentorship experience as well. So like, I know a lot of those programs will put you in touch with a mentor and um, that person will be ahead in their career and will be able to kind of give you an idea of where you wanna go. So um, that's one way to network that doesn't feel quite as burdensome to me as going to like a you know, social happy hour, which is not my scene at all. Um, but you can do a lot of that just sort of by meeting up with one person for coffee in your field um, and who has a vested interest and expressed an interest in mentoring someone like you. Um, so that's, so that's one way of creating a network that I found to work for me. And the other thing is I'll tell you a story about how I got my current job. Um, I, um, was looking for a job like this and was never, like, I couldn't ever find anything. Um, and so I was like thinking I'm going to have to do corporate law forever. And my law professor, whom I had stayed in touch with, um, and, you know, I go to his Christmas party every year and we had just kept that connection alive, um, emailed me and he said, hey, um, I don't know if you'd be interested in this, but in my husband's Stanford alumni group, someone posted that OCR is hiring, uh, Office for Civil Rights is hiring in San Francisco. And I was not looking to move to San Francisco per se, but I thought, well, if they're hiring there, I bet you they're hiring in their other offices too. Um, so I, uh, saw that and I contacted my friend from middle school who also ended up going to my law school and I said hey I know one time you mentioned in a conversation you knew someone who worked at OCR in DC um, is that true and who is that person because I got this posting and I'm just wondering if they're hiring elsewhere and so she immediately put me in touch with him they were hiring someone for their Title IX policy team, which was my area of expertise at the time. Um, and he also said, actually, all of the regional offices are hiring. And I wanted to move back to the Northwest. And so I knew they had an office in Seattle. Um, and so I was able to apply and actually got offered both that job in DC and the one here in Seattle. Um, but it was only through those networks that weren't you know, it wasn't like going to like a big networking event and trying your best to make a connection. It was just maintaining connections that were already out there in my life. So I guess what I'm trying to say is like, you have a network, um, just sort of like check in with it every so often and, um, you know, like kind of use it as much as you can, even if it's just a weird conversation you remembered your friend having with you one time, it could lead to a really great job um, down the line. Um, and I think like professors are great people to stay in touch with because they care about students and teaching. And so they love hearing from you and what you're doing. Um, and I know for a fact, someone who graduated in 08, one of my closest friends applying to grad school right now, she reached out to Nigel, who was her um, one of her professors when she was a classics major. And um, he not only remembered her, but 
remembered all sorts of things about her, including what her thesis was about and like stuff she had done in this class and, you know, immediately wrote a recommendation. So um, just always know that um, those people care about you and um, you can always check back in. And even if it's just to say hi, that you have those people in your life for a reason and um, just kind of like keep them as part of your life. I'll add uh, one quick thing. Um, something that's been helpful for me having moved around the country a few different times now has been to find the network hub. Um, so a lot of times there's someone uh, in, in a realm that you've just moved into who is that extrovert that uh, gets in touch with everyone and they're a really, really good resource to befriend and connect with and in Carmen's words, flatter, because uh, yeah, you're in with them, then you're in with everyone and they're gonna know who to put you in touch with if you need X, Y, and Z um, done or connected with. So I'll just say um, we're kind of approaching the end of the evening. Do our students have any lingering questions you want to ask? I'll also post um, contact information for all of our panelists uh, in the chat. So you can always feel free, like on the subject of networking, you have a whole network right now of alumni who um, are hungry to help you. And so um, keep their contact information if you think of questions or um, one advice or anything. If something comes up two weeks from now and you're like, you know what, I wish I'd asked Carmen, you will have her email address. So anyway, if you have some lingering questions, now's your chance. I think Dylan um, put a question in the chat. So are there instances that have been unconventional, surprising and are joyful in your career? Or have you found built community? And I think one is, so I definitely suffered, I probably still suffer from imposter syndrome. And I think one thing that I have realized over time is that usually I'm a lot better at things than I thought. <laughs> and so, you know, it's sort of like you know, I, every job that I've had, even, even the one where I was just supposed to, um, I was supposed to write copy for retail products about like, oh, your sweetie will twirl in a sparkly pink tutu. Even that one, I thought before I started, I thought, oh my God, what if I'm not good enough? What if I can't write like this? And what if, what if I just fail? <laughs> Looking back and I'm just like, okay, I was, I was way too melodramatic and I was way too um, unsure of myself. And so I think it's just, you know, the whole, this whole thing of like, fake it till you make it. Like, yes, there are instances where people do that and they fail. But, you know, I think, I think everyone who goes to read is really smart and you can probably do that. And so in every single job, I sort of feel like I've scammed everyone into hiring me, but then I end up doing a great job and I end up being a really valued member of the team and my managers always praise me. And so I think that is, so as I've worked in my career, I have grown in confidence. And I don't think that's something that I really expected when I was, you know, as I mentioned, so terrified and so, so it felt like I failed at life and, and things like that. So I, you know, I truly hope that that happens for a lot of you as well. All of you, all of you. I have uh, one experience that um, happened uh, a little over a year ago now. Um, I've had a few of these moments, but this is the one that like I, I've been thinking about a lot is um, I worked on a case um, where um, it was about um, making a school physically accessible, but also providing a accessible van because um, there was one student in the whole school district um, who went to school in a wheelchair and basically she would have to climb up the stairs of the bus every morning um, in front of all of her classmates. And she couldn't go play at the playground because there was no ramp, it was just stairs. And so we went to go measure the area where the stairs were to advise them after we had entered into this agreement um, with them to fix these problems on how to build the ramp. 
and it was, um, you know, 16 degrees and snowing and um, in a very rural part of the country that was um, involved a lot of driving on ice, which was kind of terrifying for me, but, um, and it'd been a really long day. And at the end of the day, we were talking to the superintendent and the school bus came and um, the van that pulled up was the accessible van and it lifted the student into um, the van and we watched that and that was a moment of great joy for me in my career feeling like I had a part however small in that student's um, ability to go to school with her peers and feel like she belongs there um, and I I will never forget that feeling of standing there in piles of snow freezing and very wet but just like the smile on my face um, knowing that my career could help someone um, and that person could live in a part of the country that's you know very far away from where I live and very different um, so um, I just I think that like you know everything that you put out there in the world is received by someone and so um, we don't always have the opportunity to see what the effects of our of our jobs are on people but when we do um, just hold on to that for like the really hard days when you feel like you're doing something that's totally unhelpful um, you can always like kind of go back to those moments i to tag on to the imposter syndrome because i tell people i i actually don't know what i'm doing i just kind of make it up and at the end of the day everybody goes home so i'm good uh, Early on in my career as an analyst, uh, I had a situation where I had to do some analysis regarding a traffic signal. And so if you're in Portland, there is a, a protected left turn signal at, I think it's Fremont and uh, Weidler. And I did a bunch of analysis uh, to determine whether or not we'd put this signal in. And the planner I was working with says, well, now you have to go to city council and you have to give testimony based on your analysis. And I'm like, excuse me? go where with whom and explain what I did not a traffic engineer. Well, thanks. I'll, I'll say thanks to Reed. So I wrote this like long memo explaining how, you know, here's the traffic signal. Here's why you should put it in. Here's the delay that it would solve for this particular route. Here's why this would impact the operators or not the operators, but the, the customers in Portland. And so apparently my letter was so good that not only did I not have to testify at city council, but they installed the turn signal. And I was like, oh, wow, I did a thing. I don't know what I did, but there's now a traffic protected left turn signal here at this particular intersection. And so a lot of times you'll do things, uh, which kind of gets into one of my larger points is government or corporate or all these things, they're all made up of people. They're people like you and I. They have their own beliefs and values that they bring into work every day. And that's how they essentially do their job. And when you go into work, you can still bring yourself in there and say that these are the things that matter to me and here's why, right? I have a friend who's a quadriplegic and so ADA is a huge thing for me. And I don't like it when you know people who have mobility issues can't actually access things that other people do. Some of my peers don't have those concerns, but I can still advocate for people in those areas and show them here's actually how you're actually impacting these people. And here's the reason why they actually literally aren't showing up is because they can't physically get there. Have you considered that? Right. And so those are the types of things that while you may feel your contribution may not be as significant, your contribution is still important because you're bringing yourself and pointing out an issue that a lot of people might not have recognized is an actual issue. And so in some of the work that you'll do, or, you know, even if you go to graduate school, just you physically being there is a big change because it gives you an opportunity to demonstrate this is what I believe, or this is how I actually understand how this particular process works. And you never know what may or may not transpire. Um, in the public transit industry, we are pretty open to, okay, let me rephrase that. In the public transit industry, we're a little late to modernize. And so a lot of ideas that we present, you can go to Disney World and you're like, wow, Disney World is more modern than most public transit agencies. And there's a reason for that. It's mainly because the people that work at transit agencies tend to have been there for a much longer period of time. 
as we get a younger influx of people coming in, what we find is, is that now we're actually asking for things that when you go to Disney World or, I don't know, the airport, they're modern things. But when you go get on a bus, it's still like, and why are we still paying in cash? Not that you, not that I'm saying you should take cash away because cash is an accessibility issue and I don't want to go there right now. But the point is, is that there are still ways that you can bring your different experiences to your jobs and allow people to actually see here's how you can actually serve this population that's typically underrepresented or just not present and here's why this is important um and there's like tons of those i won't tell too many because i drove night bus so all my stories they devolved into and then they all got off uh i can i can share a joyful community building story yeah i can nail that in one so uh <laughs> in graduate school i helped found a, a group called stem routes um that was aimed at uh getting students from underrepresented backgrounds into the lab to do research because typically one of the biggest barriers for graduate school is a lack of research experience <laughs> and um, a lot of the things surrounding getting that research experience involve a lot of privilege. And um, so we started that group. I started that group. Oh, and we were also trying to get it to be more inclusive. So we started a local chapter of SACNAS, which is the Society for the Advancement of Chicanos and Native American Scientists. Um, as you can tell from that acronym, it's missing some important inclusion aspects to it and so we were like well we can't just call ourselves SACNAS because that's not inclusive right so then we were we came up with stem routes and it's this dumb acronym and it is what it is but the group <laughs> is actually quite valuable and it's a group of graduate students who are getting undergrads into labs and actually doing research and trying to get them funded I left um, and that group is continuing in my absence through much more competent leadership from other graduate students. And they just got a, the president's diversity award, which came with a big chunk of money to help um, all those students. So that was a community building, inspirational experience that I had in my career that I didn't get to participate in <laughs> at all. <laughs> at the end but it was worth it to to put it together and to, to actually see something flourish in your absence was uh pretty pretty meaningful for me it's lovely i love uh ending on the joy i think that's wonderful um well you know on behalf of alumni programs and annual fund Thank you all so much for being here. I'm so excited students got to join and just be share space with you and be in community with you for a little while. Um, so one of the things um, I'll say to the students uh, is an initiative that we have going on in alumni programs and annual fund is to um, when you graduate, you'll become an alum uh, and we will send you all sorts of cool information about all the resources that you'll have at your disposal um, as an alumna, an alumnus. Um, and so uh, that includes access to our very, very new um, uh, affinity networks. We have an alumni of color network, a queer alumni network, a first gen alumni network, um, as well as um, just some broader sort of career resources and different things like that. So um, be watching for that when you get to the point that you're graduating, we will send you that stuff. Um, and yeah, just wonderful panelists. Thank you so much for giving your time to Collective Voices. This is an amazing series and oh gosh, this is just, just wonderful. 